All right, American History 2. Are we ready? We're going to learn about the Wizard of Oz today. Do you know this story? Okay. We're not really learning about the Wizard of Oz, but we're going to learn about something in history that the Wizard of Oz was based on. So if you've ever seen that story, you're going to learn all sorts of things about how the Wizard of Oz was an allegory, meaning everything in it was sort of symbolic of things that happened during a time frame in history known as the populist movement. Um, so pay attention, get focused. Um, you will see highlighted terms in either yellow or red, depending, depending on what slide we're on. These are things you absolutely must know. So, and you'll be answering some questions as we go here. Um, so let's get ready. This is one of my favorite time periods in history. Um, it's sort of a power to the people story. And um, there's many of these throughout history, but this is sort of the first, this is one of the first times we start to see power to the people. And then you'll start to see how this ties into the Wizard of Oz. So. Uh, the essential concept of this lecture, uh, this is about the farmers. Now, this takes place in the same time frame that we've been studying for Unit 1. Um, Post-1865, farmers start to have massive problems, the biggest of which is all roads sort of lead to issues with debt. Okay, um, They're going broke. Uh, farms are getting foreclosed. Why this happens, we'll look at on a future slide, but um, this is the big basics. Farmers start to have problems. They have debt. Well, what does anybody do in history when you have enough problems, you sometimes you join together with other people with similar problems and you try to fix the issues. And the big key to this populist movement is not only do they get together to try to fix issues, they're not sitting around just complaining, they're going to get into the political system. Um, they're going to run people uh, for local and state offices, politicians that are going to take up their cause, they're going to support people. Um, and this is pretty much what we're going to see that becomes known as the populist movement. There'll actually be a political party formed called the Populist Party um, that tries to get candidates and things like that um, joined. So are we ready? Um, quick refresher on The Wizard of Oz if you've never seen it. It's the story of Dorothy, who is the sort of everyman in this story, um, an allegory for the everyman in the United States history at this time. Um, Dorothy finds herself, due to a tornado, she finds herself in a fantastical land um, full of uh, munchkins and witches, and she needs to find her way home. Well, she hears that there is a wizard in a place called Oz, and you see him there in the green. Um, if you know the story of this, you understand what, what's happening there. But she decides she's going to get to Oz. The wizard is going to save her, and along the way she meets um, a variety of of characters um, pictured here, the Scarecrow, uh, the Tin Man, and the Lion. All of them, they hear her story, they hear there's a wizard, wizard can fix things, they all want to go with her. They travel to Oz on the yellow brick road. The Scarecrow has got no brains, the Tin Man has got no heart, and the Lion, he's the cowardly lion, so he needs to find his courage. So this is the adventure they all set off on to get to Oz where this wizard um, is going to fix their problems. If you have seen this movie, you know the ending, spoiler alert, when they get to Oz, they discover the wizard is a fraud. He's a fake, but the solution to all of their problems, who helps them? They help themselves. So they had it in them all along to get their courage, get their heart, get their brains, get back home. And if you see where I'm going with this, this is what populism is. You have problems in your life, you have problems in community, it's up to you, yourself, your community, band together to solve these problems through politics. All right, that's the refresher there. So let's talk about the problems that farmers have. Political cartoon, you're gonna see a lot of these in this time frame. This political cartoon, uh, there's a lot of people that couldn't read back in the day, right? This is the late 1800s. So you see a lot of political cartoons that went in magazines and newspapers. So this is from this time period. Um, it's basically showing the debt that the labor force um, is saddled with. Um, you can take a pause here and sort of analyze it if you want, but um, there's a few things there on the little gravestone that you may not recognize, but uh, here lies prosperity. So that's the happiness um, and the wealth of the farmers can't have it saddled with debt. Uh, now here's the variety of reasons and you need to know a handful of these. Mo farms, mo problems. So again, keep uh, in mind you have some highlighted terms here. So some of the things that start to happen in the mid 1800s, mechanization of farming equipment. So we start to see newer technologies 
those new technologies are gonna to lead to more expensive equipment. Farmers, of course, you're a farmer, you have a new technology, you're gonna have a mechanical reaper, you wanna go buy it, but they start taking out loans to get many of these items. You guys know the basics. You take out loans, you're gonna end up saddled with debt, okay? Price gouging, this is another problem that's gonna cause more debt. Price gouging of things like the grain, the seed, other business needs um, that these farmers need. Basically, all of the big businesses that supply these farmers with things that they need to do their make their living, they're gonna get overcharged. They're gonna get price gouged. And so this becomes a problem as well. Um, the big, bad sort of industrial system that's taking advantage of these farmers. So of course that leads to debt. Also more land. We know with Manifest Destiny, um, as people go out and they're, they're wanting to farm, there's more opportunity for more land. So in a lot of cases that they're going to the bank again for that. Um, and they're going to be taking out more debt. So you can start to see lots of problems for the farmers. Here's some more. Uh, throughout the uh, 1860s, 1870s, um, you're going to see things anywhere from weather issues, drought, uh, tornadoes. You're going to see crop failures. There's going to be a, a boll weevil, which is a type of insect that's going to uh, kind of have that plague, plagues of locusts like we saw in the story of us. All of these things decades and decades on top of each other, of course, lead to debt. This is the thing about farming that's different than a lot of other businesses. You have to put all your money up front. How do you make your money? If you're growing corn, you're growing wheat, that crop has to come in, right? So you put all your money up front. You take all that debt up front, and then you hope that the crop comes in. So if you have weather problems or things like that, um, this could be an issue because you may lose, you know, fields and fields, acreage of stuff. Um, second bullet point vocab term. Monopolies. Monopolies are pretty much, uh, you know, when you have a, a certain industry or business and they start buying up all of the other smaller businesses and farmers are going to deal with this. The railroad is going to be one of the most notorious of the monopolies they have to deal with. Banking, telegraph industry. These are all things that the farmers need to make their living and get their products to market. Well, you know, so they have some, some corn uh, come in. So that corn, it has to be store, stored, stored, uh, or let's take grain storage. So they're going to have uh, grain storage they need. Well, they may have to, to rent that type of stuff or buy products for that. So that's debt. Then they have to get uh, their grain on a, on a train that goes out east where the major population centers are. That The railroad companies are going to charge them. They go get a loan from a bank. They try to get a low interest loan. Well, they're going to get overcharged by the banks with high interest loans. Telegraphs if they have to deal with communications of the business. So you see where this is going. Big business is going to take advantage of this little guy. Hey, remember that Wizard of Oz, the Tin Man with no heart? Well, doesn't that seem like an allegory for what at the time the farmers think of big industry has no heart taking advantage? Um, and by the way, the scarecrow with no brain right? This is what people are thinking of the farmers. This is sort of, uh, you know, this is when farming goes from that small yeoman farmer that Jefferson believed into big mechanized farming. And it's not that the farmers were stupid, but the farmers really just didn't have the expertise and the know-how to how to deal with things like the banking system and all of this stuff. So times there are changing and they're changing uh, really quicker than a lot of these farmers have learned how to adjust. Third bullet point, another problem that's going to uh, help deal with the debt. Economic depression, um, something called the gold standard. This is how we backed money back in the day. We won't get too much into this because it's not an economics class, but the gold standard for, for every dollar we have in paper money at this time, um, or for every hundred dollars, we have to have a hundred dollars in gold in a bank, um, backing that money, supporting our system of money. So this gold standard to the farmers, they really believed was a problem because, by the way, also in the late 1800s, we're starting to mine out a lot of our gold. You know, the gold rushes started in the early 1800s. So what is this? The, far, the way the farmers view this is if there's not more gold, that means there's not going to be more paper money to back the money supply. Farmers believed, and this is key in this bullet point, farmers believed that increasing the money supply would solve their issues. Now, a careful thing to note on this, this isn't really true. Increasing the money supply, and you guys probably know this intuitively, if you have too much money, that devalues the money and you end up with inflation. But the farmers, they are not they don't have an economics degree. Hey, most of the country doesn't understand economics at this point. So this is what they believe. They believe we have to increase the money supply, but we'll talk uh, when they get to problem solving that this actually, what they thought would work, wouldn't necessarily work. 
Um, another problem, under consumption, that means the consumers don't exist for a lot of their products. And this is going to happen, you know, not every single year in the late 1800s, but there's going to be waves of uh, panics, as they called them back then, um, boom and bust cycles. And so there's not going to be people to consume their products. In many cases, overproduction, these farmers will uh, grow too many crops or they raise too much livestock and then the demand isn't there. So what both of these economic conditions lead to is what's called a surplus, which basically means they have too much product. So all of these things I've described, these are happening over and over and over again um, from the 1860s. Um, and ultimately, we're going to culminate up to um, a presidential election in which these farmers get a candidate that they actually are going to back in the 1896 presidential election. So kind of oversimplifying the dates, but think of like the last 50 years of the 1800s is really when most of this stuff is happening. All right, so we know there are problems. All roads lead to debt. Now you got problems, we got to have solutions. So let's take note of some few things that these farmers are doing. And again, all this is sort of happening um, in the last 50 years of the 1800s. So alliances, um, organizations of farmers start to work together to solve their problems. There's going to be all sorts of farmers alliances, the Southern Farmers Alliance, the Western Alliance, all these things. Um, and they basically are going to be... Uh, organizations in which these farmers get together and they say, hey, what can we do about some of this stuff? Um, co-ops will be formed. These are, co-ops are sort of a an alliance, but they, what, you guys know what a co-op is. If you've ever been to, uh, uh, what's the place where you go buy everything in bulk, right? Um, those are cooperatives. Sam's Club, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, that's sort of like a co-op. Everything is cheaper because when you go buy it, you buy it in bulk. So this is one of the ways that farmers are going to solve their problems is they basically are going to say, hey, if we buy grain in mass in bulk, well, that'll drive down the price and they can um, then work together in their alliance to, to have that. Um, the Grange is just one of an alliance that's formed, but this is the Grange is going to be the first real political organization of farmers that works to make change for its members. So the Grange is going to say, we have all these ideas, but how do we implement them? Well, you implement them through government, right? That's what a democracy is. So then you have to get politicians elected in local, state, and then maybe even at the national level that will push for these problems, okay? So um, here's a couple of the Grange accomplishments. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pause on this because I can only record 15 minutes at a time. And we're going to pause on this little lecture and then we'll come back and we'll wrap this up. Um, and talk about some of the accomplishments that these populist farmers um, made. And we only have a few more slides, so take a pause and go look at part two, part two.